um, made it very difficult for him to be able to do this. And so he called his home office and he asked if they could hire a plane for him so that he could be taken up above the smoke for the fire. And they said, sure. And they sent him to an airport and said, there will be a plane ready for you. And so when he arrived, there was a plane warming up near the runway. And so he grabbed his stuff and he jumped in and he said, let's go, let's go. So the pilot swung the plane into the wind and soon they were in the air. And so the photographer was yelling, fly over the north side and make three or four low-level passes. Why? asked the pilot. Because I'm going to take some pictures, cried the photographer. I'm a photographer and, photo and photographers take pictures. After a pause, the pilot said, you mean you're not the instructor? There are so many assumptions to be made and that have been made about our gospel text today. And you know what they say when we assume you make an... Oh, nobody wanted to fill that in. Also, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this text. We're going to see what's present in it. We're going to see what we assume and then how those notions make our understanding of who Jesus is. Our text begins and ends with what many people could label and do label as miracles. One is very well known and the other is probably overlooked by most of us. And in between, we get Jesus' response to the assumptions of the people who are involved in these miracles. The first seemingly miraculous story is from John 6, verses 8 through 13, that reads, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. And now there was a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. We've heard of that story, right? The story has Jesus as the central character in the midst of multiplying loaves and fish from just five loaves and two fish into enough food to feed over 5,000 people and have leftovers that fill 12 baskets. Now, they don't say how big these baskets are. All right, they could be really tiny. I don't think that's the point. But our text doesn't end. We get a second seemingly miraculous story. John 6, 16 through 21 reads, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. Have you heard this story before? It's not the most famous story of him walking on the water. I feel like this story in John gets overlooked. It's a bit more confusing. If Jesus hadn't come back to them yet, why would they take off and row four miles across the Sea of Capernaum? But it's okay because somehow Jesus shows up four miles off the shore, walking on the other side too. And then with the storm, as Jesus walks on water, then all of a sudden they are at shore. Immediately, they're on the shore. In the feeding of the 5,000, we get Jesus displaying his power over humanity. And in the stormy lake, we see Jesus' command over nature. Two realms in which we live every day. Two realms which we wish we had control. And here's Jesus showing us he can change human nature and he can influence what we perceive as the natural world. Miracles. I struggle with the concept of miracles. Perhaps it's a result of my privilege and upbringing. I've never wondered where my next meal was coming from. I've never worried about my family being suddenly torn apart. I've, I've never had concern that we'd have to move overnight. 
or any of the other things that billions of people are concerned about daily. I'm very blessed in that way. I think a lot of us are very blessed. And so I've noticed that in our minds, miracles become skewed. We view them like a vending machine. If I say the right words or if I do the right things, it's like putting my money into the machine. And then I ask for the miracle. You know, miracles like getting a close parking spot in a bad storm. Or miracles like finding my golf ball in the rough. Or the weeds or the woods. They're even further off, right? This understanding of privileged miracles assumes that God is a cold, distant formula. It assumes that the divine isn't relational, doesn't provide, doesn't care. I think that's why I struggle with miracles in our world, because we think of them in that way. I was in a very old Orthodox church in one of the poorer neighborhoods in Istanbul. It's an Armenian neighborhood. And the houses and apartments were centuries old, wooden slanted shacks, one next to the other. When we told our Kurdish roommate that we were going to visit this part of town, he asked why with concern. This was the part of town that others feared because it was filled with outsiders. Poor, downtrodden outsiders. And in this neighborhood, we visited a church. And you know that an area has put up with centuries of persecution when the church has secret passageways and tunnels and bunkers to protect the people in the neighborhood. But amid all of this poverty, the church was beautiful. It had so many beautiful icons of silver and gold, beautiful artwork and ornate woodwork. The inside of the church stood in stark contrast to the ugliness and age of the streets that surrounded it. We asked how the church got all of this beautiful stuff. They were all gifts from the parishioners over the decades and centuries. Families would give their time in trade work. They'd give their artwork. They'd proudly scrape together funds to buy an ornate icon in memory of a loved one. Out of poverty and persecution, they gave to make a beautiful, holy place. And then we came across the spot that has forever changed my mind about miracles. On one small wall, there was a painting of Jesus. And leaning against the wall and all over the floor below it were canes and crutches, splints, all sorts of medical assistant devices. And I asked, why? Why were these all here? And we were told that, they, that when people prayed for healing and were given it, they brought their medical supplies here to show their gratitude. These expensive devices weren't resold, weren't repurposed, weren't held onto because they had monetary value. They became a testament to the faith of the healed that God has provided for them and will continue. Miracles. God can change our humanity, our self-serving, idolatrous drive to make sure I get mine and bring us into a communal world where God provides so that we might help and serve with one another. The feeding of the 5,000, we never read that Jesus physically made the bread and fish multiply, but out of his great generosity to give all that he had in that moment to others, a miracle occurred. And the people gathered began to give out of the little that they had too. And soon a great moment of offering happened and everyone gave so much that there was much left over to be used in service again. A miracle. God shifted our assumption that my lunch is in fact my lunch. Instead, my lunch has been made known to me as a provision of God and may be used to further Christ's purposes. God makes us less selfish. That is a miracle. This miraculous changing in humanity doesn't end with assumptions about our lunch. It goes on to change our assumptions about everything we think we own. The world, all of our things, all the material wealth, all the extravagance and abundance, none of it is here to serve us. They're all blessings from God and an invitation to go and serve others. 
But see, I can be kind of cynical sometimes. Maybe some of you have noticed that. So what happens when we see this miraculous change in someone or in some group? We assume to know the meaning behind that change. We assume to know who that leader is or maybe the bad intentions with which they lead. We do it with highly paid prosperity preachers. We do it with mega church leaders. We do it with our own small church pastors. We do it with politicians, with school administrators, police and fire chiefs. We assume the motivations behind many leaders. And Jesus himself is not immune to these assumptions. And our faiths can falter because of them. We end up making Jesus into what we want him to be instead of letting him show us. And so we get Jesus' response. In John 6, 14 through 15, we read, When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The people assumed to know what Jesus meant by changing their attitudes about one another. That he was an earthly king meant to rule over us through law and regulation. But Jesus isn't an earthly king. He's something more. He isn't defined by a 33-year reign and then some lines in a history book. He's about affecting change and transformation in every human being, every community, every generation. And so he responds to this assumption by showing that he is more than a king, by commanding the natural world as well. This is all great about the text, but we need to ask ourselves some questions too. What assumptions in our lives shape and make Jesus? Is it that this place, that this sanctuary is built for you and your comfort? Is it that the offering plates and this communion set is here to make you feel good or maybe make you feel guilty? Do you assume that you can hoard the bread in your pockets because someone else has a bit more that they can share? Is the assumption that you made yourself, you got to where you are in life on your own? Or is there something more to life than this facade of the material? That there's something deeper about God than just doing or saying the right things? Maybe there's a relationship that's begging for us to recognize, participate, and share. We don't need to make Jesus into reflections of ourselves or into a yes man who affirms everything we've done or into a politician who will save our earthly government. That's not who Jesus is. He is the one who will stand with us in the worst and most hellish storms of our lives, the one who guides us to safety when the world and the results of our sin are thrashing us about. Jesus is the one who encourages us to think about others, to open ourselves up to sympathy and empathy, to love, forgive, and care. He can change us. He can make us into disciples of Christ if we drop our assumptions Stop trying to make him and let him form us. So I challenge you this week to see the miracles in your life. We are surrounded by them. The ways in which God has provided for you, not so you can hoard your blessings as your own achievements, but so that you might share them. And if we all do this together, we can begin to change our community. We can be great examples for our children We can create an environment that encourages our children to grow into wonderful servants of Christ. We can have moments of spontaneous and great offering and create a sanctuary that is a testament to our faiths filled with these beautiful gifts of sharing and overflowing in abundance for future service. So start where the Spirit leads you. Serve your neighbor out of your time. Give to a great cause out of your wallet. Feed your coworker out of your lunch. Stop assuming the worst in others and look for the good that is present. Because Jesus can change our humanity. Jesus can change us from our selfish ways. And that, that is a miracle. Amen.